Well, thank you very much, everybody, for logging in and for watching this, which will be, in some ways, quite an unusual presentation. Under normal circumstances, this would be taking place in the recital room. You'd have a nice glass of wine, you'd have had something to eat, and now you'd be watching me speaking. And for obvious reasons, that's not possible today. And so instead, I'm recording the presentation for you to watch in the comfort of your own home and watch repeatedly, of course, as I'm sure you will. Now, the agenda for the presentation is quite a straightforward one. I want to talk a little bit about GCSEs, the next 13 months, and what those 13 months might entail for students who are currently in the lower fifth. I also want to begin to look beyond the next 13 months at the sixth form and the opportunities that lie there, and possibly even beyond there to what happens after school and what happens beyond A-levels or the other courses that students might take. And finally, I want to talk a little bit about what it means to be raising young men and women in 2020. But before I do any of that, I've got to return to where I started, which is the reasons why I'm not presenting to you in the recital room. And that's the obvious situation in which we all find ourselves at the moment. And I think the most important thing for me to say from the school to you as parents is an enormous thank you. The, uh, the trust that you have shown in us, the gratitude that you have expressed to the school for the work that we've been doing and the support you've given to us has been nothing short of exceptional. We're very, very much aware that for all members of the Beads community, parents most particularly, this is a really difficult time. And the continued support you've given to us during this difficult time is exceptionally gratefully received by us all. So thank you very, very much. Connected to that, I obviously have to apologize for my appearance this evening. Um, my hair perhaps could do with a bit of a trim, and uh, I apologise too for the fact that I'm in a, a funny office without brilliant lighting. Um, so it's probably a good thing that you can only see me at the side of your screen. It's also another apology I've got to make is that we're trying to look ahead to the future. I don't know about you, but on a personal level, trying to look ahead to next week uh, leaves me looking a bit like this chap. And trying to think about anything beyond making sure I've got enough food in the house and uh, are the children okay at home is quite hard. But on a professional level, I have to recognise, of course, that things will pass and of course they will pass. And at some stage, we will get back to normal. And I think we'll look back at this time as some very strange dream through which we all went or nightmare possibly through which we all went. And before we know it, we're gonna be back to those things that perhaps we might be missing at the moment. The peaceful commute to work, uh, perhaps the nice cheerful meeting involving real people and a quiet night out at the pub. Those will be things to which we can get back once more. And instead, we'll be concerned with the sorts of concerns that might perennially uh, affect us as parents of children who are currently in year 10. And I think one of the issues that all of us are having to face, and I say us, and myself have got a child in this year group, is that our children in year 10 are right on that cusp. It doesn't seem like 10 minutes ago that they were lovely, sweet, young innocents who hung on our every word as parents, who were absolutely keen to go into school, looking delightful and smart, and suddenly they've grown up, and suddenly they've turned into young adults, and goodness me, it's a scary old process. But one of the themes that I want to return to in this presentation, I'm going to say it now and I'm going to keep on saying it because it's absolutely true, is that the young people in our current year 10, in our lower fifth, are a fantastic group of young men and women. And in many, many ways, in every way, they're no different to any other group of young men and women that I have seen pass through the school over the very many years I've worked here. They are doing the sorts of things that young people do. They're facing the sorts of difficulties that young people face. By goodness, at the moment, they're facing even more difficulties than their predecessors may have faced. And talking of their predecessors, what about this as a, as a description of young people? I'm going to do the thing that bad teachers do, and I'm going to read the, uh, the words that are now on the screen. Our youth now love luxury. They have bad manners, contempt for authority. They show disrespect for their elders 
and love chatter in place of exercise. They no longer rise when elders enter the room, they contradict their parents, they chatter before company, they gobble up their food and they tyrannize their teachers. Possibly sounds familiar as you contemplate what it is to have your own children at this age, particularly as they've been uh, stuck under your roof with you for the last uh, few weeks. But actually those words are apparently uh, from Socrates, from several thousand years ago, quoted in an excellent book by the former headmaster of Eton College. Now, rather disappointingly, possibly, those, those words aren't entirely accurate and they weren't necessarily from Socrates to start out with. But I like to think of them as a reflection of the fact that young people have forever been guilty, in inverted commas, of behaving in a particular way. It's part of the contract. And I say I labour that point because I don't want you as parents to think that because your children occasionally get it wrong, there's anything unusual about them. In that same book, the one by Tony Little, is this fantastic piece of advice that he gave to housemasters who were looking after boys, and it was boys, it was a, it was is a single sex school. So I apologise for the fact that it's boys, but it could be girls as well. The advice that he gives to housemasters to give to um, uh, parents. Look at that fantastic advice that would go to a parent from the housemaster. That lovely young child is about to undergo a transformation and you will feel that you have mothered a monster. Don't despair, ride out the storm, be firm but affectionate because this is when your child needs you the most. Make a stand about the things that you regard as fundamental, but give them rope about the less important things. And to my mind, that's amongst the wisest piece of advice that I can give you in terms of looking after children at this time. Because it might seem that our children are revolting and obsessed with things that we find difficult to understand. It might seem that they see the world in a way that we can't relate to. It might seem that they get it wrong. But actually, those children who look lovely on our school publicity material and are smart and decent, in fact, I look at our current upper six, our leavers who are preparing to head out into the world, um, having had the end of their school career uh, dealt such an extraordinary blow. And these children here on the screen in front of you now are children from the last few years who are leavers. And time and time and time again, I see people who have made it through to being 18 years old and have cast off those difficulties that faced them when they were this age. So I want to talk a little bit about the next 13 months, about the GCSE courses that our children are currently, well, halfway through almost. And of course, what we've got to remember is that for our children in this year group, this is a time when they have faced disruption too. A lot of focus has gone on to those people who are facing public exams, and rightly so. But what about the students in year 10? And it's worth remembering that actually it's not that far until they'll be taking their public exams, assuming, as we must, that in the summer of 2021, things are back to normal. And by goodness, we certainly hope that is the case. So our students in the current lower fifth will be taking their GCSE exams will be starting to take them in May of next year. So 13 months. In fact, in 13 months time, they'll probably be well into their GCSE exams. And that's quite a scary thought in some ways. Now, just in case you're unaware of the, the changes that have taken place, the vast majority of the qualifications that your children secure won't be A's to E's. There'll be numbers, 987, all the way down to a one, or hopefully not too many ones. And the pass rate for that is a grade four. So in, in the past, we would have been looking for a student to achieve at least a grade C to represent a pass. Now that's a grade four, a standard pass, and grade five, a strong pass, and then it moves up from that. And hopefully our students will be able to be securing as many high numbers as possible. The only exception to that are those students who are studying business or economics, which is still graded on an A star to E um, uh, grading um, rate. And of course, those who are doing BTEC courses where they'll get distinctions and merits and passes. And what that means is that to some extent, our children in this year group will still be like people traveling in Europe 
30 years ago who would come home with a big wadge of different money. They'll have a few French francs, a few German marks, a few Dutch guilders. They'll have a, a, a few nine to ones, maybe an A star to E, maybe a, a, a merit or a pass or a distinction. Does that matter? Not really. I think the days when all qualifications looked exactly the same are long gone. And also a word about coursework that uh, your, your children will be taking or including in their various qualifications, or in fact, as it's now called, non-examined assessment, NEA. And there are some subjects in which there will still be that non-examined assessment. The days when there was a big chunk of coursework for every subject are long gone, but in various different subjects, as you can see from that list, many practical ones where it's fairly obvious why you would need to have some non-examined assessment, there will still be the chance to stack up some grades, stack up some marks before the exams in 13 months time. And then of course, the students get their qualifications in the summer of 2021. Now this is a photograph from this summer of last year's GCSE students getting their results. They look about as unexcited as it's possible for a group of people to be. They look like backpackers checking the bus timetable. So I'm just gonna use a slightly older photograph of children looking genuinely excited at their GCSE grades. And the question you might be wondering is how do we help our children to be leaping into the air for a, a, a wonderfully naturally posed photograph like this when their GCSE results come out? What are the things that our children need to be doing in order to secure success at GCSE? And I would argue that it's partly to do with their attitude, it's partly to do with their focus, and it's partly to do with their organisation. And then underpinning that, is the level of hard work that they put in. But attitude will take you an enormous distance. Focus will absolutely take students along the way they need to go. And being organized in what they're doing and knowing precisely what the approach is that they need to take is absolutely crucial. And the hard work that they undertake is also crucial. There's no secret that hard work leads to success. And I think at GCSE level in particular, I think students sometimes believe you need to be a genius to get lots of really, really good grades. It's not true. In a lot of cases, it's simply a case of working hard. The harder I work, the luckier I get, as some golfer or other once said. However, underpinning all of that, I want to just refer to this chap, who, as you can see, is from the LSE, the London School of Economics, Professor Layard. A couple of years ago, he did a, a big study, he led a big study on the causes of adult happiness. What were the things that would make people happier rather than less happy? And a lot of the answers that he came up with were things that perhaps one could predict, perhaps one could expect that you are going to be happier if you have a decent income, you're going to be happier if you've got physical health. And down in seventh place there, qualifications. So your qualifications are an important factor in your happiness. And of course, we would argue that qualifications lead to possibly better income, possibly being having more chance of being employed. But number one on his list, way above qualifications, was mental health. Number one cause of adult happiness is the quality of the mental health that those adults enjoy. And I think that's absolutely important that we remember that at all times. Of course I want the grades that our students get here to be the best they possibly can be. Of course I do. And if they're not, my job is on the line. So it's in my own personal interest to make sure that children get the best possible outcomes in their GCSEs and later A-levels. But I would argue 100% that underpinning that, positivity and self-esteem and good mental health are far, far more important about the, the, than the precise nature of the grade that somebody gets in a particular GCSE. Ultimately, the grades we get in our GCSEs are important, of course they are, but they're not the most important. They're not things that are going to make the hugest difference to our lives. And at this point, possibly just a note about the use of technology. Now, this is something I would always raise at a time like this. I think given the current situation in which we find ourselves, goodness me, will our children be overdosing on the screens at the moment? And I wonder how we feel about that as parents. I wonder how we feel when we see children using technology in the way that they do use it. And I think what I would say is this, of course, technology presents all sorts of challenges. 
It presents an enormous number of challenges to us as parents, and it presents challenges to the children who are using that technology. But in many ways, the issues that it brings to the fore are issues that have always been there for children. I think as parents, we might want to return to the 1970s. We might want to have the idea of coming home and seeing our children doing nothing but making, not quite sure what that boy, a big snake or something out of uh, an old sock. We want children to be doing things that we find wholesome and lovely. And I think children do still do those wholesome and lovely things. It was lovely to see a number of people getting involved with a flower pressing activity, a remote flower pressing activity um, this week. But nonetheless, the idea that technology is an evil that we need to crush in order to protect our children's mental health is one that I would urge us to be wary of. Of course, it presents dangers. Of course, it's something that we need to be careful with. But at the same time, as we are seeing at the moment, it presents so many opportunities to us all. Going back to the idea of GCSEs and, and the next 13 months, two people who are absolutely crucial to you, are Miss French and Mrs Waterhouse, who between them oversee years 10 and 11. So hopefully you'll already have had some connection with one or both of those, and you'll have a sense of the importance of their role in your children's education. But they've got that overview of what your children are doing as they push to get the best possible grades in their GCSEs. But I would say the other important people are you as parents. And the key thing, add into those things about organization and the hard work and focus and so on, I think the key thing is you as a parent constantly talking and discussing and debating and sharing things with your children. Go back to that line from the housemaster at Eton from the 1960s, when it seems as though your children are pushing you away, this is when they need you the most. So GCSEs in the next 13 months, it's going to be a busy 13 months and inevitably next term, the Christmas term, is going to be busier even than it would have been under normal circumstances because of the need to catch up with time missed at the moment. Having said that, there's no doubt that for some students, working remotely is something that allows them to work at a faster pace than they would have done in the classroom. So let's move on to the next element of this presentation, which is about what happens after GCSEs in 13 months time when we do those GCSEs, what next? What happens in the sixth form? Well, most students will take three courses, whether those are A-levels, B-techs or pre-use. And the decisions about those courses are made this coming autumn. And that's going to come really, really fast. It's not going to be long at all before the summer is over. We're all back. Hopefully everyone is well and healthy and we're able to be thinking about that future. So the autumn of next of this year, 2020. And one of the things that we've got to bear in mind is the importance of academic results when we're looking ahead to the next year. So this document, which I've put on the screen, you won't be able to see the detail of it, although this is something we'll be sending to you in the fullness of time. But what I'm showing it to you is just to show that actually for each A-level course that we offer or each sixth form course we offer, we have a criteria that students have to achieve in order to access that course. Why? Because we don't want students to be entering courses that we think they're going to struggle with and not be able to achieve on. So it's not, I really genuinely don't care about league tables. League tables mean very little to me. I'm very, very fortunate that as a school, we're not, we don't have people chasing us, demanding that we rise a few places in the league table. It's not about that at all. But what it is about is making sure that individual students undertake the A-level qualifications that they are most likely to succeed at. So that's why, for example, if you're going to do maths at A-level, we ask that you have at least a grade seven in GCSE maths. If you haven't got a grade seven, you've got a six, a B in old money, the chances of you being able to access maths A-level are really pretty slim. And what I don't want is children sitting in maths A-level classes or whatever it might be, simply unable to access those courses. So for different subjects, we have different demands. So making sure that children are better qualified go on to those various um, uh, courses for them. So that's something for, I think, our GCSE students to be aware of. The work that they put in now into their science GCSEs, for example, will determine the subjects they're able to take 
in the sixth form. And I think at the head of all of this, we have to remember some very wise words from this chap, who is the founding headmaster of the senior school, Roger Perrin. Had the great privilege of working with Roger for a number of years. And um, he still occasionally appears in the school, he's a great fellow. And one of his things, which he used to say repeatedly, was that we only come to school in order to leave school. And he was absolutely right. So part of what we are doing, even now, even with children who have only been here for a year and a half, is looking ahead to what comes after it all, what happens next. And I think one of the things I just want to talk about very, very quickly are the nature of some of the courses that children can do. Now on the screen, and again, don't worry about the detail of this, but this is, for, this is the university detail offer for one particular student last year. You might be able to see they undertook three courses in the sixth form. They did a double BTEC in business and a BTEC in IT. Now, some people might look at those courses and wrinkle their nose a little bit. But look at the universities from which they received offers. Liverpool, York, Sussex, Aston, Oxford Brook, top universities. Likewise, this student did A-levels that some people might wrinkle their noses at. <laughs> Philosophy and ethics, art, media studies, are those proper A-levels, some people might say. Well, look, they're aiming to study architecture. They received an unconditional offer from the University of Portsmouth and very achievable offers from Kent, Oxford Brooks and the University for the Creative Arts for studying architecture, one of the most demanding courses of all in terms of offers. And the final example I'm going to give you is this student who wanted to study social anthropology only at Durham or Bristol, got offers from both of those two with a BTEC and two A-levels that people might have seen as being so-called easier options. And the reason I labour that point is I genuinely don't believe in the idea that any particular subject is easy or of less value. It depends wholly on who you are, what you want to do, and what your aspirations are uh, for your future. The other thing to bear in mind, of course, with a sixth form, is that we're not just eating a bowl of gruel, and that is a bowl of gruel, apparently. One of my favourite lines from the whole of Shakespeare is this one from King Lear. Allow not nature more than nature needs. Man's life is cheap as beasts. In other words, it's about more than just the gruel. Now here I need to apologise. I wanted to show you a lovely photograph of our fantastic sixth form centre, but I couldn't get in. And because there's nobody around at school at the moment, for obvious reasons, I've had to rely on these architect's drawings of it before it was put together. But actually, Often you look at these architects' drawings and then you look at the, the real thing and there's no similarity between the two. This is exactly what it does look like in the Sixth Form Centre, something that we put together uh, last year. It's a beautiful space for, chil for children to work in, to socialise in, to come together. It provides a hub for the Sixth Form. It's been brilliantly well used and well resourced. There are a couple of staff who've got their office in the corner who are available a coffee machine in there. It's a fantastic place for young people to feel a bit of space where they can uh, relax, where they can work, where they can socialise with each other. It's got a lovely atmosphere to it. It's not just gruel, it's having fantastic facilities like that. And it's also, I would argue, doing all the things that make being at a school like this wonderful. And all the things, actually, I hate to say it, but things that at the moment we're having to do remotely. So it's taking part in sport. Real tragedy for our brilliant girl cricketers who are such a fantastic team that so this season when they would have been all conquering and they've not had that opportunity. So I very much hope that next year uh, those girls will still be playing cricket and still be able to do fantastically well. It's about being in boarding houses or day houses and being part of a community. That place at the bottom right is our local primary school, Park Mead in the, in the village, where a number of students go to help out or it's about working with the animals in our school zoo or keeping in touch with nature. It's about all of those different opportunities that make sixth form life uh, better. And it's about, I would argue, helping children to develop that grit and becoming the sorts of people who are able to be successful, whatever success might mean. And it's worth pausing at that point just to commend the students in this year group for the brilliant way in which they've dealt with all these problems that life is throwing with them at, throwing at them at the moment. And they've dealt with those issues and I hope feel that they are emerging stronger at the end of it all. 
And I would argue that all of this stuff isn't a luxury. It's not something that's nice to add on. It's an absolute necessity. Those of you who are employers, I would ask when you're looking at your, your potential people to come into your, into your workplace, you're looking for people who are well-rounded and balanced, not just people who have got the finest academic qualifications, although those fine academic qualifications matter hugely. So as we look ahead to what lies uh, in the pathway for your children in a year and a bit's time, again, I would urge you, talk, discuss, debate, share with your children. It's not too early to be having those conversations, not too early to be asking what they might feel they want to study in the sixth form, what their hopes might be, what they're looking forward to, what their aspirations are. Because after the sixth form, the next step is what happens after school. I had a nice photo earlier on of people jumping in the air, celebrating their GCSE results. Well, here are some of them jumping in the air and celebrating their A-level results last summer. These are our last year's leavers. And there they are again, very spontaneous photograph, celebrating those A-levels. And then they head off to wherever it is they head off to, to university in the majority of cases, but by no means all cases. And I'm going to talk a bit about that in a second. It's worth just pointing out something, though, about the demographic dip that some of your children will be aware of. And you might be, particularly if you've got older children, you may be aware of. As we think of those young students, young people around us, those, those adolescents, one of the things that's happened in recent years is that there's been far fewer 18-year-olds um, in this country. As a consequence, universities who have been able to increase their roles, been able to bring in more students if they want to, have been trying to attract students from a much smaller body of people. However, those of you whose eyesight is very good and are glancing at that graph, which shows the number of 18-year-olds in the country from 2000 up to 2034, will notice that we have just emerged from that dip and the numbers of 18-year-olds are rising. So by the time our children in this year group are heading to university, the number of 18-year-olds and 19-year-olds will be much greater than is currently the case. Why is that significant? Because if you've got older children, one of the things you may have seen is that students are getting into university with relatively, relatively low grades. You might be told that the standard entry requirement for a course is two A's and a B. The child gets three B's and yet still they get the place at that, on that course. Will that be the same for these children in this year group we're talking about now? Very possibly not. It's worth bearing in mind. It's going to become a great deal more complicated for these young people to take that next step. And I think it's also worth just pausing briefly. And again, this might seem like it's a very long way ahead, but it isn't, about the value of going on to university. So this is a study, a huge study, published in 2016, that tracked 260 thousand students for 10 years. It's a massive study. And the purpose of it was to look at the effect that going to university had on income of students. Now, I've got to pause at this point and say that I 100% do not believe that the purpose of going to university is to increase your earning potential. The idea that we as human beings are nothing more than money-making machines is one that I would find incredibly depressing. And as somebody who studied English and teaches English, I believe that going to university to study my subject, to study English, is something we do because we enjoy it and because it makes us richer, as, 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 as makes our minds richer, more able to deal with all those issues that face us as human beings. Nonetheless, nonetheless, one of the arguments that people will put forward about going to university is that it increases our earning potential. And when the whole university experience has become so monetized, clearly that's something we need to be thinking of. Well, not perhaps altogether surprising. If you study music or drama or dance, you're not going to be earning quite as much as if you study medicine or economics. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. Male graduates, maybe there's a a thing in there of them being male. 
who went to 23 universities, and those universities aren't named in the study for obvious reasons, they earned less than the median for non-graduates. In other words, by going to a specific university, you ended up earning less than you would if you'd left school at 18 and not gone to university at all. Slightly fewer number of universities for female graduates, but the point is this. For some people, going to university isn't going to pave the, uh, the future road with gold. And it's worth listening to this chat. There he is when he was on Desert Island Discs a couple of years ago, thoroughly engaging and interesting chat. He's Sir Peter Lample, who founded the Sutton Trust, whose existence is to uh, serves to help those people who are not born into a life of privilege. And look what he is saying. He is arguing that it, university is not the best destination for all of those people. So he has spent his life trying to help people uh, break out from the financial constraints into which they're born. And even he is arguing that, and I quote, there are far too many kids going to university. And he was pushing degree level apprenticeships. So I think the, the upshot of that is that university isn't the answer for everyone. For a lot of students, it is the answer. For a lot of students, it's going to be the best and most fantastic three or four years of their lives, but not for everyone. And that's why a few years ago, we appointed this person, Deborah Franks, who is the head of careers and employability at the school. If you've got a son in Knight's House, you'll also know her as the deputy head of Knight's House. And she is a brilliant colleague, brilliant. And part of what she does is help our young people think about the paths that lie ahead for them. And in some cases, that might be an apprenticeship. Cue obvious photograph of Lord uh, Sugar. And at the moment, there are over 800 types. I think it's actually nearly a thousand types of apprenticeship that are available to our young people. And they're in all sorts of different jobs. And what's important for us to recognise about them is that they bring with them funding for the training, so very different to going to university, and that you also receive a salary when you're doing it. So as you're learning, you're also earning. That rhymes, unintentionally. Apprenticeships exist on all sorts of different levels. There are GCSE equivalents at a much lower level, and those would be in the more traditional trades, but they also go all the way up to degree level. And here we've got, over the last couple of years, we've had seven students who have gone on to undertake apprenticeships of one sort or another. And of those, I, I've stayed in touch with a couple of them. Some have worked really well, some haven't, as is the case of the university as well. But they're going on and trying to make their first steps in a whole range of different industries. And we've got five this year who are looking into it and applying for degree level apprenticeships. I wonder how many of you recognise these pictures. They're from a fantastic TV series that's been going for the last, gosh, nearly 60 years, I think. Started at 7 up, 14 up, 21 up, and so on, tracking various children. And I wonder whether the die is cast for who we are when we're born. Certainly, in some ways, that's the lesson of that series. It shows us the three little boys on the left who come from exceptional lives of privilege, and sure enough, by the time they're in their 50s and 60s, they're still living exceptional lives of privilege. The girls on the right aren't so blessed with where they're born. And sure enough, through their lives, they find things a bit tougher. But I'm not sure that things are quite so cut and dried as that. Just on the screen there is a picture of a footballer called Stephen Schumacher. As you can see, he's now retired. He was a coach at Berry, who, if you know anything about football, went bankrupt last year. He played for teams in the lower end of the league football uh, pyramid, non-league as well. He had a decent career, I'm sure, but not a footballing great. I remember seeing him when he was 17, playing for England schoolboys, and he was exceptional. He was brilliant. He was somebody who, at the time, I said to my brother, was going to go on and catch in England and be utterly brilliant. And for whatever reason, it just didn't work out. He ended up coaching at a club who went bankrupt. Conversely, this is a person you won't recognise. He's actually a very old friend of mine. And uh, he is the deputy director of the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts in the USA, one of the top five art museums in America. Michael is a world expert on the art of uh, Marcel Duchamp. Um, those of you who know your Dadaism will know Marcel Duchamp. Michael left school at 16. There's just a few O-levels as there were in those days. Why do I mention him? Why do I mention Stephen Schumacher? Because I believe very, very strongly 
that for our children in year 10 now, the die is not cast. W whatever university they go to, whatever they decide to do, there are still all sorts of possibilities that lie ahead for them. But if they are thinking of universities, I think it's really important again to begin that conversation now. Do they have any sense of what the UK is like as a country? I always remember a conversation I had a number of years ago with a girl. She was called Annabelle and she was very Annabelle-ish. She liked horses, she liked Laura Ashley clothing and she was looking to go to art college. And she was looking to go to art college possibly in Bolton. Now, Bolton, I am sure, has its charms. Absolutely, it has its charms. If you like pies, it has its charms. If you're called Annabelle and you like horse riding and Laura Ashley clothes, I'm not sure that Bolton is the place that you necessarily should be thinking of. I once said that to an audience and somebody, some chap put his hand up and said, told me um, very nicely that he came from Bolton and I was, I was being un, unfair to besmirch it in this way. Nonetheless, the point is one that I think is important. We need to think about the sorts of places where we might be happy. And again, this might be two or three years down the line. What about Bangor? This is the city of Bangor in Northern Wales. Looks beautiful. For me, it looks beautiful, but it's my 50th birthday in a week or two's time. So I'm not necessarily the sort of person that would be thinking about going there as a student. I looked up Bangor and TripAdvisor to see if I were to go there, what would I find that was exciting? Well, these are the top attractions in Bangor. There's a castle, there's a nature reserve, and third on the list is something called the Bangor Garth, which I think is a very long bridge. And then the fourth is the university itself. If you want a wild time, my suggestion would be that Bangor isn't necessarily the place to go to. I wonder how many students turn up in Bangor thinking they're going to have the wildest and craziest time of their lives, and they get there and find there's a nature reserve and a bridge, and that's about it. So I think that conversation about what places are like and what it might like, what it might be like to study at particular places is really worth having. It's worth looking at league tables of universities. It's worth looking at league tables of league tables. And they tell us things that we already know. Of course, we know that Cambridge is a great university. Of course we do. But I wonder how many of us, for example, would be aware that Coventry University has been racing up those league tables for all sorts of reasons, in terms of the quality of teaching, student satisfaction, outcomes at the end. So I think a conversation that we should be having with our young people at the moment, these year 10 students, is what might lie ahead for them after school? And if they are going to go to university, what sort do they want to go on a campus university like Sussex? Do they want to go into a university where in the middle of a city? Who knows? Do they care about the location more than they care about the course? If they want to live in a wild town, Bangor isn't the place for them. If they want to live somewhere where there's a fantastic nightlife and great pies, maybe Bolton is the place for them. But I think it's important that students think about that and are aware of what might be waiting for them down that path. Where about do they want to go in relation to where home is? For some of our young people, I'm sure the idea of going to Brighton University or Sussex University, if they live in Brighton or Sussex, is genuinely fantastic. For others, woo, take me away from here. This chap, Paul Gibbs, he oversees UCAS for us at the school. Very, very helpful. And hopefully he will be someone who will be very useful to you over the years ahead. So again, key thing, I think, is talking and discussing and debating and sharing. Just been joined by my dog, who's come to join our presentation. He's a lot more interesting than I am sometimes. So please keep those conversations going with your young people. And the last thing I want to touch on briefly is that issue of what it's like to be raising young men and women, the hardest job that any of us can do. And I mentioned earlier on, I've got a child in this year group. I've got four children, all at various different ages in their teenage years. And Sometimes I feel I am as completely clueless as the best of us when it comes to raising children. But what I do know is from a school perspective, what it's like. It's always easier to talk about other people's children than it is to talk about your own. And Some of these fantastic young people who have emerged from the school over the last few years, what is it that helps make them so fantastic? 
Now this chap is a, is a guy I, I've heard speak on a number of occasions. He used to be the headmaster of Harrow, he's chairman of the Independent Schools Council. I disagree with him on all sorts of things, I've got to say. He, um, I think his idea of a good school is a bit more of a boot camp than the sort of school that I would like to see. But nonetheless, he's got an awful lot of fantastic things to say. He wrote a really very, very interesting book about what it was that made schools successful. One of his key points to parents is to remember that you are the parent, not the child, you, and that children absolutely need and want boundaries. That doesn't mean to say we all need to turn into Robocop and be revolting to our children, but it does mean that those children need those boundaries and guidelines to help them cope with all the issues that they are coping with as young people. Absolutely key. Uh, key point. The second thing that Barnaby says, which I think is absolutely true, is that as parents, we mustn't be afraid to confront our children's behaviour. Children get it wrong. They're 15 years old. They're going to get it wrong. They're going to behave in ways that we find unacceptable. They're going to behave in ways that we find wrong, as we did almost certainly when we were that age. And we mustn't be afraid to confront that and put them right when we feel that their behaviour is falling short of the expectations that we have as parents. So that's his second point. And his third point, and I love this point, is that as a parent, we should support the school in matters of discipline. And the argument that Barnett, of course schools get it wrong, of course sometimes they go after a child and they shouldn't do. But his argument is, yeah, they get it wrong sometimes, but also they miss things sometimes. So the chances are that if a child is being punished for something, even if it's unjust, they probably got away with something the week before. And I think the key point he makes there is that it's a united effort. We are on the same side. You as parents, we as a school, we are trying to achieve the right, the same thing, which is the right outcome for the child. The other thing that Barnaby says, again, it's so true, is that we are not our children's friends. They don't want us to be their friend and we're not their friend. But crucially, the approval that we give to them, the interest that we show in what they're doing, and the love that we feel for them is so important for them. Really interesting times at the moment, obviously, and a lot of us are spending a great deal more time with our families than we might previously have had the privilege of doing so. I don't know about you. Of course, there are huge frustrations. Of course, there are huge worries about the current circumstances in which we find ourselves. And of course, there are many, many negatives. But one of the absolute positives is the time that I feel as a parent, the time that I've had to spend with my children, the time I've had to be able to show that interest in all that they're doing. And that's such a precious gift that we've been given in amongst all of the unpleasant stuff we've also been given to deal with at the moment. The very fact that you're watching this, and if you're still watching this after 44 minutes, that's pretty good going. That sh that's a good thing. It shows that you are interested in what your children are doing. It shows you're interested in their schooling. And I think children need to recognise that sometimes as parents, we don't give them everything they want. I want to be a professional footballer. It's not going to happen. So we can't always get the stuff we want. But what we can get are things that enable us to feel secure and settled and happy. And I'm going to return to this point about the strength of our, the, our, of our children's mental well-being. One of the, the terms that you will have heard applied to young people is are they the snowflake generation, the generation that melts at the sh first sign of anything? I hate that phrase. I hate it. It's disrespectful to the ways in which our students, our young people, our children are coping with all of the stuff that they have to cope with. And I... I know a good number of students in this year group particularly well because I teach them. I know a number pretty well. I think I can probably recognise pretty much every child in the, in the year group. I can put a name to a face. I don't know people who are snowflakes. I know people who are dealing with difficult lives, and difficult issues and doing all they can to cope with those struggles. And we as parents can support them as they are doing that as they struggle to, to make a pathway through a very, very complicated life. And I think it's really important that we don't allow our children to forget that we're not perfect either. I'm there in that picture looking a bit tidier and smarter than I look today. 
but a few years ago, I didn't quite look so marvellously sharp. And I went through my ridiculous phase when I wanted to be the lead singer of The Cure and wear earrings uh, all the way up my ears and look vaguely ridiculous. And I think our children need to recognise that we are fallible, we get it wrong. We, are, we went through times when we were not as marvellous and wonderful as we might be now. The other thing I would say, and this actually is something that uh, that headmaster, a uh, housemaster from Eton said in his letter to, to, to new parents, something that Barnaby Lennon says, don't worry about the small stuff. If your child's bed looks like Tracy Emin's bed, does it matter? Don't worry about the, the things that are, are unimportant. And of course, work is important. Of course, academic success is important. But there are other things that really matter. And if your children are doing some of these things around the home, if your child has ever emptied the kitchen bin without being asked to empty it, you have got a fantastic son or daughter on your hands. If your child ever phones a relative without being told to do it and asks how they are, if your child has got some interest, that is enough. These things are wonderful things that we should celebrate. So I would say that one of the marks of our young people is the extent to which they empty dishwashers and clean loos and empty rubbish bins. And if they do all of that thing, all of those things, and they tie that up with working reasonably hard at their studies as well, we are hopefully on the right lines. We're hopefully making the sort of progress that we should be making as we look to raise our young people. And it's the fourth time I've said this, that's because it's really important. The most important thing that we can do as parents is to talk with our children, to discuss things with them, to debate with them, to share things with them, to show our own vulnerabilities, our own fears, and our own worries, but at the same time to also make sure that we listen to our children and hear what their worries are, what their vulnerabilities are, what their fears are, particularly at the moment, particularly when times are so difficult. Well, as I said earlier on, if you've watched this presentation, you've done a fantastic job. I want to return to the point I made earlier on, which was to thank you for watching to thank you for, for um, uh, coming in here and watching this, but also to thank you for um, everything you have done to support the school over this very, very difficult time. We've tried to keep things as normal as possible for our students. We've tried to make sure that their school experience can continue to be as rich and as invigorating as is possible, given the constraints under which we're operating. And we've also tried to make sure that school is one less thing for you to have to worry about rather than one more thing. Hopefully, we've managed to succeed in that to some extent. So I finished now by saying thank you very much for watching, to say that I absolutely, sincerely and genuinely hope that your own situation at home is as good as it possibly can be in these difficult times, to thank you for entrusting your children to us and to say that I and all of my colleagues really look forward to being able to continue working with your children over the next three years. Good luck as they go along that journey. Thank you very much and bye-bye.